Thank you all very, very much. Tom, David, and I, my business partners, are so excited to have you all over to the GIR building in a little bit. We're thrilled, and it's a monumental occasion for us because today, all of you are going to represent the first audience in an event that's going to take place in the fourth story grand ballroom in over 30 years. Thank you for joining us for that. We're extremely excited. <laughs> While you're over there, we're also going to give each and every one of you a job to do. So don't leave before you've done it. We'll clue you in at that. It doesn't involve hammers or nails or anything, so don't worry. But we're excited to have you there. I want to tell you a little bit about the history of the building. Some of you may know it as the GAR building. Some of you may know it as the castle. Some of you may have just driven by it and wondered, why is there a giant stone fortress just plunked down in the middle of Detroit, all abandoned, alone for 30 years? Well, Tom, David, and I asked those same questions. And we've come through our relationship with the building to find out that it's had an amazing life. And I want to tell you a little bit about that before we go over there today. In 1866, at the end of the Civil War, the Union veterans came home to the North. When they came home, like many men and women who come home from war, they felt bereft. There was a void in their life. That bond that they had formed during the trauma of war was suddenly gone, spread out across the country. And they felt like they needed to regain some of that camaraderie. They needed to find a place and a way that they could express the, the memories of the amazing things that they had done in the battlefield, the, the men who died next to them, the ability for them to keep this union together and strong. So they formed the GAR, and that stands for the Grand Army of the Republic. It was this nation's first veterans organization. And over the next 30 years, it grew to become not only the veterans organization, but the most powerful political lobbying group, the first political lobbying group in this country. And despite all that power and that persuasion, the local groups, they were called posts, that made up the Detroit GAR, still had to fight tooth and nail with the Detroit City Council for at least two years to negotiate the land and the funds to have that building built. They did it in public in the press, you can go to the Burton Library and look some of these up. They were hilarious and vicious. They probably did a lot of backroom arm twisting as well. But in 1899, they finally succeeded. And they were able to lay the cornerstone at the corner of Cass and Grand River. That same stone is there today. And you all walk right past it as you enter the building. For the next 35 years, they enjoyed the halcyon days of that building. They lived the life in there that they wanted to live, that they had it built for. And it wasn't just them. There were other members. Other organizations that participated, the Daughters of the Union Veterans, the, the Ladies of the GAR, the Children of the GAR, the Women's Relief Corps, all of these groups were able to gather and honor the memory of the fallen soldiers who had fought so hard to preserve this union for our country. They threw a hell of a lot of good parties, too. And we know this not because we have a lot of pictures of this or detailed records. We know this because we found their humidor and it was made up of old busted up whiskey crates. <laughs> Certainly a deserved party. But in 1934, 24 veterans were left alive, and they were too old to take care of the building. So it reverted back to city ownership, and its first use was as a welfare center. And then in 1942, it transitioned again. It became the GAR Parks and Recreation Center, and it lasted that way until 1982. This is the longest single stretch of use that that building saw. And those were happy times, too. As a matter of fact, I ran into a gentleman today just in the lobby who had been there during that time. Many of you have been. If you, if you haven't, you probably may know somebody who has. And you may have come in through the grand entrance, that giant arch on Grand River. And you may have walked across this beautiful inlaid tile floor that you're going to see when you get there. And you may have gone and visited the Detroit Federation of Musicians. You may have taken some music classes there. You may have been part of the civic theater group that performed plays. You may have been part of the dance troupe that was on the third floor there. You may have gone and played shuffleboard on the fourth floor where we're going to be. And you may have been uh, playing indoor golf. Or, if you were over 40, and you were lonely, and you were in need of some, some digits, you may have gone to one of the over 40 singles parties that they had. So those were all fun times. Those were good times, too. The building had a long, vibrant life. But in 1982, the doors locked. And shortly after 1986, the boards went up on the windows. And all of that life, all that light, all that vibrant energy died away to darkness, loneliness, abandonment. There was nothing left. There were a few little bits and pieces here and there, and you'll see some evidence of that. Urban spelunkers who came in, left their mark. The homeless, just trying to get out of the cold and the weather. And generations and generations and generations of pigeons who left their skeletons and mounds of crap. <laughs> We've got all that cleaned up now. You don't need to worry about it. It was a sad time, though, to see this phenomenal space abandoned 
and left alone. About a year ago, almost to the day, November 1st, 2011, after six years of negotiations with the city, Tom and David and I were finally able to buy it. And it's our intent to pump some serious CPR into that building and bring it back again to that full, vibrant life that it once had. That's the history of this. We'll tell you about the future of it when we get over there. And thank you again all for making the trip over here and especially for climbing all four stories to get here. That was, uh, that was very heroic of you. Um, I told you a little bit about the history of the place uh, over at the gem. And now, as I promised, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the, the future of this place. Now, you all got markers when you came in. Hold on to them because, as I said, you're all going to have a job at the end of this talk that we want you to take part in. So what are we going to do? What's the next chapter? What are we going to put here? Well, despite the fact that we are falling head over heels in love with building rehab, it's not our first business. Our first business is actually a company called Mindfield. And what Mindfield is is a creative boutique agency. We do media. We do uh, cutting-edge interactive uh, technological um, interactions. We do stadium-sized LED content, giant projections. We do broadcast commercials. We do uh, videos that go straight to the web for Fortune 100 companies all over the world. As I said, we also have a very creative arm that does a lot of technological interactions, touch screens, um, haptic interfaces, mobile. So it's a very creative agency. And right now, a year from now actually, this will be our office. You're standing in our office. I think my desk is right where you are, Charlie. <laughs> um, in addition to that, on the ground floor, we're going to put two restaurants in. On the second and the third floor, we're going to lease those out to businesses, hopefully like-minded businesses, so we have a synergy in the building. And in the, what's that? You all lost out. Charlie takes the third. In addition to that, in the empty spaces, the leftover spaces, the stairwell that you all climbed and the grand lobbies of each floor, we're going to put in a museum in memory of the GAR members who formed this place. And that's going to be an interactive museum. There's going to be touchscreens on the wall, artifacts, so it's going to be a high-tech place. So how are we going to do all this? Well, that's the easy question to answer. We have a phenomenal architect and building team involved. We have some very committed carpenters and electricians, structural engineers, people who are so dedicated to this building, it continues to blow my mind. So we're on the right path, and right now we're actually ahead of schedule. If that continues, we actually will be in here a year from now. The more intriguing question is why? Why would we take all that newness that we have here, all that cutting edge technology, and try and cram it into a building it's 113 years old. It was never built for something like that. Why would we try and do that? I have a, a story that I, I heard probably about 15 or 16 years ago, and I don't know why I like it so much. Maybe it's just because of the accent that's involved. Uh, but it involves a lost traveler in Maine, and, and he's got his map out. And he opens it up, and he finds this local, and he says, how, how do I get there from here? And the, and the local looks back at him and goes, well, you can't get there from here. You've got to go backward to go forward. Yeah, funny, right? Backward to go forward. It doesn't make much sense. Until you realize what kind of rewards you can get when you do go backwards. And kind of the learning experience, it's obvious one, we have to learn from our past, right? There's so many lessons in the past that we can't forget, that are amazing to us and can help us accelerate our futures as we learn them. And in this pace of change, in this pace of technology, when everybody is trying to do more and be more and always advance and always take that next step, it's more critical than ever to remember where we came from. Eddie Obang did a talk in Edinburgh this past summer wherein he proved that that pace of technology, that incredible speed of curve of everything going faster and faster and faster and faster and up is literally outpacing our ability to learn it. We flatline. We can't keep up. And as the owner of a high-tech company, I live this every day. I can go on TED right now. I can whip out my mobile phone and download a talk that's going to tell me about the next greatest thing that's coming out. And my clients are doing the same thing every day. And they're calling me going, I want the next greatest thing. I just saw it on TED. That's amazing. So I'm going, yeah, great, great. I'm trying to wrap my head around the last next greatest thing that came out three weeks ago. Meanwhile, this week's next greatest things are piling up. I got next week's next greatest things to worry about. Is it the right next greatest thing? I don't know. I got to look at that. I got to figure it out. My client wants it now. Wants it yesterday. Oh, hold on. So when those moments come, I take a walk over to this building. And I stop and I look up at five stories of this amazing edifice, centuries old rock. And I pause and I have a realization. Sometimes the next greatest thing isn't the newest greatest thing. Sometimes the next greatest thing is what's been staring back at us for 100 years as we've been walking by. 
Our forebears didn't have access to the technology that we have today. They didn't have access to the knowledge that we have of physics, chemistry, biology, medicine. And yet they were absolutely brilliant, and in a lot of ways, more so than we are today. I mean, we still argue about how Stonehenge was built. And many of us marvel at the fact that it was only men, ropes, few animals, and levers that built the Sphinx. That's incredible. Those are ideas that stand the test of time. I wrote most of this talk in a public library. Thank you, Benjamin Franklin. That's 200 years of process technology that still works today. And while we're thanking him, if you've ever put on a pair of bifocals, guess what? 200 more years of tech that that man invented. So what about entertainment? Well, I still bust a gut every time I see Charlie Chaplin. That's old entertainment. And there are thousands and thousands of people around the world that get belly laughs out of watching him to this day. Comedians refer to him. They even rip off his stuff right now because it's funny and it works. That's entertainment that lasts. And what about design? You're standing in it. This building is classified as a Richardsonian Romanesque structure, and what that means is it's built on architectural principles that were developed in years with a BC after them, and that were implemented on this plot of land over a century ago. That is amazingly old stuff, and I heard it on the stairwell today. I heard it all day today, and I can't tell you how many times over the last year that I've heard it from people I don't know that I've barely met from the region, nationally, even all around the globe, that come to me and say how lucky I am to be an owner of the most iconic, impressive, important building in this city. It's mind-blowing. The idea is that these people got it right. They absolutely got it right. We need to be able to learn from those experiences, to draw cues, to help us go forward. Those ideas find the foundation for our future. In addition to learning from them, another important thing, and maybe the most important thing, is that we need to draw inspiration from them. In getting to know this building, we found a number of stories related to it, related to the people who were involved in it, related to people who are intrinsically linked in it. And I want to tell you some of those stories now because they have inspired me greatly. There's a common thread, and I think you'll pick up on it. But as I tell these stories, I really want you to try and imagine what it must have been like for the people involved in them. Close your eyes if you have to. Think about it. See what they saw. Hear what they heard. Walk in their footsteps and imagine what it must have been like to be faced with the decisions that they faced. The first story is about our 16th president. Some of you may know that this man had two failed businesses. That his fiance passed away very early on, which drove him into a great depression, leading to eventually a full-on nervous breakdown. He ran for office six separate times and lost every one of them, a failure. And yet he still thought he had what it took to be the president of our country. So he ran for that office. And while he was running for that office, a friend of his son's wrote him a letter, needed some support, needed some advice. And Abraham Lincoln wrote back, I know not how to aid you, save in the assurance of one of mature age and much severe experience, that you cannot fail if you resolutely determine that you will not. He obviously went on to win the presidency that year. And that presidency became the most difficult tenure that office has ever seen before or since. This man was hated roundly. He was dragged through public press so abusively that if it were to happen today, there'd be slander charges. Members of his own cabinet hated the man, called him a fool. And this was the man who decided that he was going to hold the United States together to preserve the Union. And it wasn't just that easy decision. In doing so, he knew, he consciously knew that he was sending thousands and thousands and thousands of good, strong, young American men straight to their deaths. Would you have had the courage? Would I have had the courage for that? Daniel Crotty, a member of the 3rd Michigan Infantry, was a flag bearer. His job was to lead the charges into battles, carrying nothing but a flag into battles that over the course of three days sometimes saw more casualties than all of the casualties we've accrued in all 11 years of the Afghan war, in three days. Imagine being at the forefront of those charges next to Daniel Crotty with nothing but a flag charging the enemy. He tells us a story from the Battle of the Wilderness that took place in 1864. 
The fearful butchery commences on the morning of the 7th, and charge after charge is made on both sides. The sights that meet us all around are sickening in the extreme. Bloated corpses are lying around in all conceivable shapes, and more are added to the numbers every minute. An incident happened today during this day's fight that I shall never forget. As we are going forward on the charge, a wounded soldier is borne to the rear on a stretcher and caught sight of my tattered banner and begun the song, Rally Round the Flag, Boys! Every man took up the words and went in with renewed vigor, and we drove the rebel lines inside their works. Daniel Crotty brought that flag home to Detroit, a war hero. He was a recipient of the Kearney Cross, the second highest commendation in the land behind the Congressional Medal of the Honor at the time. And he came home to Detroit and he became the commander of Fairbanks Post Number 17, which met in this room. He walked these halls. He stood where you're standing right now, where you're standing right now. His is the caliber of character that built this place. Other GAR members who walked these floors, courageous men of the 102nd U.S. Color Division, 1,500 free men of Michigan who had to live and endure and fight through battles just like I described to you, except they did it with the added weight on their shoulders of racism and hatred with every step that they took. And yet, in that, still managed to distinguish themselves as courageous above and beyond the call of duty. There was a white officer who served with them, and he wrote the following. While reflecting on some reports which have just reached me from the front, where we have a detail of 300 men from our regiment under command of Colonel Chipman, I reverted back to the time of the organization of the 102nd. During that time, it was almost a byword, and those connected with it subjects of derision. But now its praises are on everyone's lips, and here at least it is an honor to belong to what was once known as the 1st Michigan Colored Regiment. And then he goes on to describe those reports. He says, on one side of our detail of 300 men, the 54th Massachusetts was drawn up. On the other, a white regiment, the 127th from New York. And here, our forces covered themselves in glory. It is acknowledged on all hands without stint that our regiment maintained the steadiest line of battle and fought with the greatest determination of any troops on the ground. Many of those who were wounded quite severely refused to go to the rear and yet fought on while the blood was flowing from their wounds. Would you have had the strength? Would you have had the strength to fight like Celestine Hollings fought? Celestine Hollings was the first African-American woman elected to the national presidency of the Daughters of the Union Veterans. Her group met in this building. And were it not for her, none of us would be standing here right now. In the early 90s, she had a battle with the city council, fought tooth and nail in the public press and in courts for years to preserve this building because they were ready to have it de declared unsafe and torn down. And she wasn't going to have it. She put everything she had into saving this building. Even when her own organization told her, Celestine, that's enough. We're tired. Give it up. And she wouldn't do it. She's 92 years old today, a little woman this tall. Three weeks ago, she came back to this building for the first time in over 30 years. And she climbed every one of those steps on her own. She did it without a single hand of aid. She didn't want it. She didn't need it. And when she walked into this room, her face lit up because she had finally won. Tom and David Carlton, my business partners, two brothers who in 1992 thought it would be a fantastic idea to sell their homes in the suburbs and move into the heart of downtown Detroit. One year after Detroit posted its second highest homicide rate in the previous 20 years. Why would they do that? Well, they thought, hey, you know what? Let's buy a six-story, abandoned, blacked-out building with no heat on a mostly vacant lot, and let's live in it. That's a good idea. And while we're doing that, let's rehab it from the inside out with our own hammers and nails and sweat and blood and money and tears. If you knew Tom and David back then, the word insane might have been how you described them, and it was commonly used. Why would they do that? But today, the library lofts is a thriving, fully leased building with one of the most notable restaurants in it on the ground floor. It's across from a beautiful city park next to an amazing downtown city library. We've got a burgeoning art gallery and a florist on that block, and Curb Detroit recently called it one of the hottest blocks in the city. Well, that adventure laid the foundation for this adventure. Story after story after story that I continue to draw experience from. There are so many more that I can't even tell because we don't have the time for it. 
I think you probably have picked up on that common thread that I talked about earlier, the one that continues to drive me forward, that idea of perseverance. When I walk into this building, that's all I see is perseverance, and I'm struck by how it's a one-to-one -one correlation with this building and this city. They both share a common question. They both share, what happened? How do we go from the Paris of the Midwest to a city derided nationally for crime, for poverty, for abandonment? How does a once thriving stone castle end up abandoned, bereft, lonely, boarded up for 30 years? Those are great questions, but thankfully they're questions that are in the past, and they have to be there because that's how we measure our perseverance. We look backward, we see where we started, we see the hurdles that we needed to cross, and we measure our success against how well we cleared them. We look backward so that we can look forward. That is the heart and soul of this city. That is the heart and soul of this building. And perseverance is intrinsically what it means to be a Detroiter. We stick it out. But the beautiful part of perseverance is not in the past. The beating heart and passion of perseverance is forever and always aimed into the future. You can't persevere unless you have something to persevere for, a hope, a goal, a dream, an ambition. What is that next great thing that you're going to reach out and grab? Abraham Lincoln believing that he could hold this country together. Daniel Crotty, believing that he was going to bring that American flag home. The courageous members of the U.S. 102nd who fought with every last drop of their blood for a freedom that today we can't even imagine being without. I draw strength from that. I draw strength from that. So when people ask me, why would you take your high-tech company this, this creative design firm, and try and put it in a building that doesn't have any space for wiring, barely has plumbing in it. That's crazy. Why would you try and put two restaurants in the ground floor of a building that doesn't have an alley? Where are we going to put our dumpster? We don't own parking around here. How are people going to come down for this? Why would you put a museum in a stairwell? That's nuts. Who's going to come down here and visit a museum in a stairwell in a neighborhood that currently has nothing else around to visit? Thank you. <laughs> My answer to that is that we cannot fail because we are resolutely determined that we will not fail. So what does all that have to do with technology, with entertainment, with design? Well, we believe firmly that the best idea is always preferred to just the next idea. Minefield is a high-tech company. We deal with the latest greatest, like I said earlier, all the time. That's our job. We need to always be looking forward. But if we did so without the foundation of what we've learned from the past, those great lessons of the future that form a foundation from us to, for, for which we leap from, then we're fools. We're missing the point. You can't just go flash in the pan because that's not going to work. When you do that, you're a paper airplane that burns flames as soon as it launches. If you take the time to go backward before you go forward, and study why things have worked in the past, why have they stood the test of time, then your ideas, as you build on them, will stand the test of time and not just be the next one-hit wonder. I'm going to tell one more story. Amy alluded to it just a second ago. Gabriel Richard, on June 12, 1805, wrote some words. And he wrote them following the greatest destruction that this city has ever seen. The entire city burned to the ground, heaps of ash and rubble amidst amazing tragedy, the loss of his parish, the loss of the school that he had just built, he wrote the words that would eventually become Detroit's city motto, that would eventually be put on the state of Michigan's first flag in 1827. He wrote, Speramus Miliora, Resurgit Canaribus. And translated from the Latin, that means, we hope for better things. It will rise from the future. And that's the real heart of this city. That's what keeps us all striving to do more, to be more, to continue to go forward. That's the beating pulse that I hear every time I walk in this building. And that's what keeps me and my business partners striving to make it a better place. We are inspired by the strength of purpose in those who came before us. And we can only hope that as we move forward into the future, we do them honor to their courage and their valor that they showed to get us this far. Now it's time for you to go to work, Detroit. You all got markers, and we have walls. We want you to take these markers right now, put them up against these walls, and tell us your stories of perseverance. Tell us how you're going to move forward. Write your name. Make your mark on these iconic walls, because when you're done, we're going to photograph every one of them. They're going to blog, and we're going to put them in the archives for the museum, and they're going to lay the foundation for the next generation 
of Detroiters who come after us, who in moments of doubt and impatience can look back and say, we did hope for better things, and it will rise from the future, from the flames. Thank you.